And this is uh, Emma Blanchett uh, from University of Windsor. So Emma, you have you also have 12 minutes for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, thank you everyone for listening to my poster presentation. I'm just gonna zoom in real quick in order to take you through my poster so all the relevant figures in the text are clearer and readable. So hi, my name is Emma Blanchett. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student and my group at the University of Windsor is using an optical technique called laser induced breakdown spectroscopy or LIBS for short to identify pathogenic bacteria in cl clinical specimens. The ultimate goal of our work is to create a diagnostic test that can diagnose any pathogenic bacteria in any liquid sample, like blood, urine, spinal fluid, contaminated water, a nasal swab, an infection swab, in under five minutes. So by collecting bacteria with swabs, as shown in this blue box here, and concentrating them on disposable filters using a custom design centrifugation device, as shown in purple here, we have been very successful at generating high signal to noise optical emission spectra from very low numbers of bacteria. The LIBS laser creates a high temperature microplasma as shown here in the orange on the filter and the bacterial cells are completely ablated generating a spectrum that we show down here, which allows us to quantify all of the inorganic trace elements in the bacterial cell. So in our spectra, we have phosphorus lines, carbon, magnesium, calcium, and sodium lines, and these lines actually help us identify what kind of bacteria we have. So moving over to this central graph, this graph is demonstrating a portion of our library for E. coli at various concentrations, including various controls, and the controls are seen uh, in the black dots, the teal dots, and the dark blue dots, which represent blank filter and DI water, respectively. The graph shows the strength of the LIBS emission spectrum and how that relates to the number of cells in each spectrum, where the strength of the emission is found by summing all emission lines. You can see here that our control samples largely have a low intensity and concentrated species have a much higher intensity. The relationship between signal and concentration follows a vaguely linear, linear trend, but due to the large amount of scatter, it does not scale exactly. Uh, the solid lines that you see here in this graph represent the average signal intensity of all control samples, and the dashed lines represent one standard deviation from the average intensity of all control samples. So our goal with this graph is to have all bacterial signal intensity above those average and standard deviation lines independent of concentration. We can tell the difference between bacterial species by using chemometric algorithms whose process is described in this box here. And we also have an example output of that graph from a program that we commonly use called partial least squares discrimination analysis. And this works very well for us. However, in cases where we have low signal, as exemplified by this orange point right here on the graph, it appears as if we're ablating water or our water control sample. And this low signal causes a misclassification. So basically we solve or we approach this problem in two ways. First, we can look at techniques to improve our discrimination, like using outlier rejection methods on those spectra that are outside of the norm. And second, can we change the signal or can we increase the signal to differentiate between bacteria and a control sample, in our case, namely water. So moving over to this orange box here, currently to externally classify bacteria, we use a library of spectra that are similar to what we are trying to identify. This is what we call our current total library, which contains five species of bacteria and two control samples, samples totaling to over 1000 spectra in our library. To increase our library size at a faster rate, we increase the sampling density per filter. To do that, we decrease the spacing between the laser craters from 250 to 150 micrometers, which not only gave us more shots per filter, but also better utilize the bacteria on that filter. And here at the bottom of that yellow box, we show two SEM images, and these depict the laser craters and the spacing between them. 
So now on to the actual solution of the problem. Uh, training the library is one of our approaches to improving classification, and that's shown in this left purple box here. And the idea here is to remove any spectra that did not classify correctly from the library, essentially taking only the best data moving forward to keep in the library. This method is still under investigation, but it is showing some promising results. Our next technique in the same vein is called outlier rejection. And the goal of this technique is to remove outliers as the spectra are being acquired or as they are being shot, thus eliminating any spectra with a weak signal before they even make it to being classified. So our first method uh, was histogram analysis. So we investigated rejecting data based on the weakest signals in each set of data. And to do this, we constructed a histogram for each filter as shown here. And we analyzed that histogram and basically took out all the spectra that are represented by this lone bar at the bottom circled in green. This classification uh, analysis, however, did not improve the accuracy significantly. So next, we investigated rejecting spectra based on its intensity compared to the controls, in our case, DI waters, average intensity plus or minus one standard deviation. This, however, resulted in throwing out a majority of the bacterial spectra, which made the discrimination a lot worse. So the overall conclusion of this is that removing spectra shows some improvement, but it has not solved our problem completely, and we're still working on ways to improve our accuracy. So now our second solution or approach to this problem involves signal enhancement. And we investigated enhancing our signal because in a clinical environment, physicians will likely not have the luxury of working with concentrated bacteria. So we need to be able to diagnose the presence of bacteria or the sensitivity with very low concentrations. And this method also addressed the issue of throwing out too much data as discussed previously. So to enhance signal intensity, the plasma emission must also be enhanced, which involves increasing the number of free electrons. This has been shown to work with silver nanoparticles in the past as they have an abundance of free electrons. In this research, however, we use silver microparticles. Originally, we physically spread silver microparticles on the filter, but this resulted in filter scorching and a lack of reproducibility in terms of silver concentration on the filter. So to solve this, we designed this custom plastic box, as you see in this figure here, which allowed us to control for concentration, reproducibility, and achieve that trace amount. And much like nanoparticles, we found that silver microparticles also increase the intensity of emission, as shown in this table right here. And this table shows an increase in phosphorus about to fourfold. This phosphorus line is very important in our discrimination. It shows increases of sevenfold and 27-fold in magnesium and calcium as well. In this PLSDA test here, we also show that bacteria with silver do show discriminatory ability. So our next steps in this vein are to quantify enhancement of the silver microparticles to determine the nature of their enhancement. So this represents the body of our work that we have and our progress thus far. And I'd like to thank NSERC for funding this work, as well as providing me with funding to the USRA scholarship and the University of Windsor and their Outstanding Scholars Program for additional funding. I'd also like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Razy, for all of his support and guidance in this project, as well as the students that I worked closely with during this project. So thank you all for listening to my presentation and for your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, presenting your poster to us. Are there any questions? Any questions for Emma? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, can you use your technique for larger organisms like yeast? Um, we actually have attempted that in the past. We didn't look too much into it, but it seems promising to say the least. Um, so yes, we can definitely use our technique for larger organisms, especially since the Libs uh, emission or the Libs spectra is mass dependent. So basically the more you have, the more signal you're going to get. 
Okay. Yeah, because it could be really useful. Some pathogenic yeasts like Candida auris, they have a lot of trouble um, identifying them, so it could be a really good application. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for that question. Anybody else? Hi, nice presentation. Um, I, I have a question. Maybe uh, you're a little bit too far away from it yet because your technique is early on. But you plan to use this uh, in a sort of a an environmental or even possibly a clinical setting. Uh, will the background uh, that the bacteria are, are collected from, will, is that going to influence the, the spectra? quality and more particularly is it going to influence the discriminant quality of your test um, because I I would presume that uh, you've got a nice clean environment here uh, and you're doing a comparison with um, with with uh, very clean water but I would presume it, that these bacteria will be collected under pretty messy conditions uh, relatively speaking. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So we actually looked extensively into that last year. Um, we basically developed a cleaning or a preparation method to try and reduce that background signal because that background signal was a huge issue for us. And it definitely is messing up our discrimination sometimes. So basically, we've tried to come up with ways, implement cleaning methods that can be used in a clinical setting. And one of the ways that we found that reduced contamination was basically ultrasonicating in acetone followed by methanol for five minutes each. Um, that's one of the ways. We definitely still have to do more thinking on this, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome.